join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Alex Stone. Hi guys, can everyone hear me? Wow, from the, from the title of that book, it sounds like there's, <laughs> I'm gonna be talking about everything. Uh, well, I wanna thank you guys. Uh, I'm also very excited because this is the first time I ever to say this. Uh, I'd like to thank the Academy. Uh, I'm excited. Just, just that clip right there. I guess the Academies, but whatever. There's more than one, right? Um, I wanna thank everyone. Jennifer, Susan, I wanna thank you guys for having me here. This is a, it's a big honor. And um, thank you all for showing up. It's a big crowd. I didn't expect that. Probably shouldn't have had so much to drink earlier. But, um, <laughs> but we'll do it anyway. Um, first reading I ever gave, my publicist said, whatever you do, don't read. <laughs> so I've decided that the best way to start these things off is with a magic trick. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump right in. I'm going to show you something very simple, and then I'm going to break the cardinal rule. Does everyone know what the cardinal rule of magic is? <laughs> don't show how it works. Exactly. So before anyone gets angry, if you have a problem with that, please excuse yourself now. <laughs> because I have gotten in trouble for this. I've gotten in a lot of trouble. In fact, I got banned from my local magic society for revealing secrets. Letter received by certified mail, the whole nine yards. There was going to be a trial and everything. Um, magicians take it very seriously, and I respect that very much. Why am I going to tell you how it's done? Well, the answer is something that I hope to reveal to you in the course of this talk. And that's that Sometimes what's behind the curtain is as interesting as what's in front of the curtain. And the reason for that is because it tells us something interesting about what it means to be human. So with that note, I'm going to start by showing you a trick that you've probably all seen before. It's not that special, but I would argue that it has something quite magical behind it. I'm going to take a coin. Can everyone see? I'm simply going to make it disappear. Uh, everyone see that okay? The camera, I want to... Oh yeah, there we go, perfect. Watch, I'm just gonna put it in my hand like this. I'm gonna make it very, 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 very small. That's it, wow. Ah. So where is the coin? Well, it's not here, it's not here, it's not here. Oh, there it is, right here, okay? All right, so the question is, how did I do it, right? Well. I heard, that, I heard someone say misdirection, and I'm glad you said that, because that really is the heart of magic, right? We've heard that. What's the saying we've heard? The hand is quicker than the eye, right? We've already heard that. Well, I want to argue to you that that's actually false. It's not that the hand is quicker than the eye. It's that the hand is quicker than the mind, right? Let me explain to you what I mean. So take this trick, for instance. What am I actually doing? Well, I pretend to put the coin in my hand, right? What am I actually doing? Well, I'm palming it, right? Okay, don't tell anyone. It's just, it stays, what, what happens at distinctive voices stays at distinctive voices. <laughs> so that's interesting from a manual dexterity standpoint. It's not, it's a skill that takes practice. But why does it really work? What sells the illusion? Well, if you look carefully, if you look very closely, you'll see that the coin appears to be in the hand for a split second after it's no longer there. Can everyone see that? Look at this. Look at that. Doesn't it just really just look like it's there? Look at that. I swear it's there. Okay? Magicians call this getting a good burn. But there's, a, there's a scientific term for it as well. It's called a positive afterimage. What's actually going on in the brain when your mind sees this is that the neurons, the brain cells that process the image of the coin are still firing for a second after the coin is no longer in sight. So it's, in a way, your brain connecting the dots, filling in the image. It's the brain that's deceiving you. It's your brain that's lying to you, not me. <laughs> Doesn't work for my wife, either. <laughs> so you mentioned misdirection. Why does this interest me? Well, I started doing magic when I was very young. When I was about five years old, my father bought me a magic kit. My first gig was my own sixth birthday party. Um, it went horribly. I was heckled and booed off stage. Um, it's gotten better. <laughs> Therapy and, and whatnot. Uh, as embarrassing as it sounds, I got more interested in magic as an adult. And the reason is because it combined my interest in 
fooling people and magic and science. Science, it turns out, and I studied as a physicist, and I, my father's a geneticist, I have science in my blood, has a lot of overlaps to magic. Magic exploits these little wormholes in our brain, these gaps in our awareness that are distinctively human and are the flip side of some of the things that we need to function as productive, intelligent humans. Misdirection is really just a way that magicians force you into multitasking mode. We think of misdirection as look over here while I'm doing this over here, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. We've seen from research, a lot of which is essentially magic tricks done in a laboratory setting, there's a whole literature in cognitive science on how you can be looking right at something, but if you're distracted, you might not notice it, right? You might be looking at this ring, for instance, which I take off my finger and then just put it back on very quickly like that. Did everyone see? No, it's really not a big deal. Here, I do it again. I put it in this hand, but actually it's right here the whole time. Now, it's not that your eyes weren't looking at the ring or maybe you didn't notice what I did. It's not speed. It's that when your attention is elsewhere, you miss things that are quite obvious. And magic exploits that principle. But this is a principle that extends to our daily lives. For instance, it's why you shouldn't drive while talking on a cell phone or text or Snapchat or hoop jaw or whatever the new thing is. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I topped out at MySpace. Um, uh, so, so why shouldn't you talk on the phone while you're driving? Well, part of it is that you shouldn't be holding a phone, right? But studies show that voice, the hands-free mode doesn't really make you that much safer. And the reason is it's not the hands that are the problem, it's your mind. It's that talking on a phone is cognitively a fairly demanding task. And scientists have created experiments that demonstrate this often dramatically. One of the foremost researchers in this field, a person who really coined the term inattentional blindness, which is the scientific term for a kind of blindness that arises when you're distracted. It's a problem of the mind, not of the eye. Is, um, she, her name was Arian Mack, and she works in New York, and I did an experiment with her, actually. The original experiments were people looking through eyepieces at pictures and things like that. We did an experiment where we brought people into the lab and we stole their watches, okay? Yeah, I know, we gave them back. Um, they didn't want to, but, uh, and you know, it wasn't the most rigorous experiment. We found that more than 80% of people didn't notice. We distra I distracted them, I used sleight of hand. Uh, there are magicians who do it professionally, who, who steal watches as part of their shows. There are professional pickpockets, uh, theatrical pickpockets who can steal ties and glasses and whatnot. Uh, she's done an extensive amount of research in this field. So have other uh, scientists. Uh, Daniel Simon, for instance, did the famous gorilla experiment. Raise your hand if you've seen that. Okay, a fair few of you have. In this, great. In this experiment, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, people are shown a tape of, uh, of a bunch of people passing around a basketball, and, and they're asked to count how many times one of the team passes the ball. In the middle of this, a gorilla, or a person in a gorilla suit, actually, walks in the foreground, waves at the camera, and then walks off. Now, you'd think it would be, you'd think anyone who wasn't blind would see it. Turns out that about half, more than half of people just don't see the gorilla. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. It's a very dramatic example of that. Well, the reason they don't see it isn't because the eye doesn't see it. In fact, eye tracking experiments in this experiment and other similar experiments show that the, the people who don't see the gorilla are looking right at it. The, the photons of light, the particles of light are entering their retina and barreling down the optic nerve. In fact, hand is quicker than the eye gives the eye a bad rap. The eye can detect motion on the order of one hundredth of a second. It takes only five particles of light, five quanta of light to trigger a visual response. It's the brain that's not seeing. Magic and these kinds of illusions are cognitive illusions, not visual illusions. They're illusions of the mind, not of the eye. All right? Interesting? <laughs> okay. So our brain fools us. Our brain wants to be fooled. And magic, for fun, sometimes for more nefarious purposes in the form of crime and sleight of hand and cons, takes advantages of these loopholes. But why do we have them in the first place? Well, let me give you an example. When we talk about paying attention, right, what are we really talking about? Well, the psychologist Alison Gopnik, who wrote this wonderful book called The Philosophical Baby, 
talks about how when we say that adults are good at paying attention, what we really mean is that we're good at not paying attention. What that means is we're good at focusing on a lone task while ignoring peripheral distractions, or at least some of us are. <laughs> but that's a good thing, right? Otherwise, we'd be in trouble. We have ADD, which I guess I have too. But uh, the point is, if you can't focus on one thing and ignore other things, it's hard to get anything done. Right? So that's a good thing. In fact, that's a virtue that makes us intelligent human beings. But the downside of being able to focus on one thing while ignoring everything else is that things that happen outside of the zone of our attention, again, our attention, not necessarily our vision, will often go unnoticed. So it's the flip side of something that is a signal virtue of the human brain, something that we should be glad for, our ability to pay attention, to focus, to go deep into something. Magic exploits this flip side of this human, human attribute and you know, hacks it in a way the way a, you know, a hacker would exploit a vulnerability in a program. I tend to think this is part of why, in some cases, children are harder to fool than adults. I've done some talks on this. I did an episode of Freakonomics Radio where we brought in a group of adults and we brought in a group of children and we found that the children were far better at figuring out the tricks. Um, a lot of people think it's, you know, they don't like magic because it makes them feel stupid. It's not really about intelligence. It's really more about how you see the world. Uh, and anecdotally, a magician will tell you that, you know, the hardest crowd is a group of nine-year-olds. Uh, when I was at Columbia, I, I'd do magic tricks for top physicists, you know, Nobel laureates. And quite frankly, they were dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for that, as far as that is you know, concerned, they're pretty easy to fool. Um, and I think it's because they, you know, they expect the world to be logical, they expect it to be rational, and magic is very much not that. Einstein was famously fooled by this one trick that's just done with a bunch of coins. It's really kind of silly. Um, but kids, I think their attention is more diffuse. And, and Gopnik talks about this in the book as well. They're, they're more scattered. And that makes sense when you're trying to understand the world and see how it works and pick up on different cues. It's how we learn. It's a part of the developmental process. But in some sense, it makes it easier to see things that adults have learned to be blind to. Right? So there's that. Um, but I think it's time for another trick. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, well, another thing that we can be blind to is changes. Uh, there's a thing called change blindness. Have, has anyone ever heard of this? May or may not. Uh, change blindness is when we're blind to changes in consecutive scenes. And I'm going to show you this, and I'm going to tell you how it's done again, because, well, I, I just I don't care anymore. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just use two cards. And I have here the eight and the nine. Can everyone see? Are those in the, can everyone see that? Ah, there we go. Okay, eight and the nine. I put them in the middle of the deck like this. Okay. I just wave my hands like this, like that. And look at what happens. They come back to the top. Whoops. That one jumps to the bottom. Eight and the nine, right? Now, what'd you say, sir? What's your stand up for a second? What's your name? Rohan, I remember you. Rohan, you're, you're interested in math, right? Math and magic. There's a lot of connections. I, I probably don't have time to get into it tonight, but there's a whole chapter in my book on it. There's beautiful connections between mathematics and shuffling, the seven shuffles results, uh, the Faro shuffle group theory. What, were you, what did you just say? The suit switched. Rohan, give everyone, everyone give Rohan a, a round of applause. Okay, you can sit down now. <laughs> or, or I could, no. Uh, how many people notice that? I mean, okay. Not, not very many of you, quite frankly. <laughs> Mostly just Rohan. <laughs> Mostly just Rohan. That's exactly right. I, I put the eight of spades and the nine of clubs in the middle of the deck, and on the top I just had the eight of clubs and the nine of spades. Yeah, right? Very, very simple, very, very deceptive. Doesn't take a lot of practice. Try it. It's good for a free beer. That's one nice thing about learning magic. You rarely have to pay for drinks. That's also the one bad thing about learning magic. <laughs> you rarely have to pay for drinks. Um, so, 
that's, a, that's an instance of what psychologists call change blindness, which is uh, a failure to notice differences in consecutive scenes. Re relatively straightforward version, but like inattentional blindness, psychologists have taken this to the extreme to see just how drastically we can be fooled. Right? And again, it all comes down to how we pay attention. How many people have seen the movie Pretty Woman? Okay, all right, that, our educational system still works. <laughs> um, so there's a scene in that movie, younger kids have no idea what I'm talking about. It's a pretty, it's a good movie. Um, there's a scene in that movie where uh, Julia Roberts is eating breakfast after she spends the night with Richard Gere, and she's eating a, a pancake. And then the camera cuts away, and it cuts back, and now the pancake has magically turned into a croissant, okay? And then it cuts away again and cuts back, and now it's pancake again. Uh, it doesn't make it a bad movie. There are other reasons for that. Um, <laughs> actually, I love, I love Pretty Woman. It's just, I'm just going to put that out there. It's a pretty great movie. The shopping scene is, is priceless. Um, that's an instance of what's called a continuity uh, error. And there are many, many, many continuity errors in almost every movie. There's one in The Godfather that's really blatant at the, uh, that scene where Sonny gets killed at the toll booth. If you look at that, seconds later, the, after being machine gunned, the front window is, is restored. Um, <laughs> check it out. And they're, they're in every movie. In fact, there's geeky websites where people you know, make notes of them all and <laughs> catalog, catalog them. But again, it's not, it doesn't matter. It doesn't ruin the film. It's just a fact that movies are spliced together, less so in the digital age, but still they're very much spliced together from lots of different scenes and, and lots of footage. And people don't notice these often glaring changes. Um, well, that's also an instance of change blindness. Uh, perhaps the most dramatic one was done by the same guys who did the gorilla experiment. What they had people do is they had researchers stop pedestrians on the street and ask for directions, okay? How, how many people heard of this? This is crazy. <laughs> this time, no. <laughs> Sorry, Rohan. Sorry. But that, you still win. You won the. Um, so the, they asked, had the pedestrian ask, ask people for, uh, had someone ask pedestrian for directions. And while the pedestrian, who was a strange, you know, stranger, was telling the person, uh, a couple of uh, stooges, a couple of Confederates, also in on the experiment, walked between them holding a, uh, obstructed, you know, a door or something, I don't remember exactly what it was, that obstructed their view temporarily. And in that moment, the person that had asked directions, the researcher switched places with one of the people holding the... the <laughs> so that moments later, the person, the pedestrian, the passerby, was giving directions or talking to a completely different person. And astoundingly, astonishingly, most of them didn't even notice. Okay? <laughs> Incredible. So that's an example of being blind to changes in the same way that we can be blind to things that happen uh, when we're focusing our attention on, say, remembering where that you know, Jamba Juice was. Uh, that's in my head because I had one this morning. It wasn't good. I don't know. what That place is not good. <laughs> um, it's, except the really sugary ones. But then what's the point? Uh, might as well just get a milkshake. Uh, if, that's, if there's one thing you take away from that talk, <laughs> this talk. Uh, so why, so why, um, you know, I just completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> While you're trying to explain to someone, give them directions or tell them where, you know, where, where to walk, that's actually a pretty difficult thing to do. It's like talking on the phone. You have to think, you have to visualize. So that's a skill that we have. And the flip side of that is our brain sort of shuts down other functions, right? So we don't pay enough attention to who we're talking to. And normally that doesn't really matter because normally people don't spontaneously change into other people before our eyes, right? Just like in movies or just like in... But a magician is skilled and knows how to exploit that for fun. But again, your brain is the one lying to you. It's your brain that cheats and your brain that deceives. And this is how a magician works, but it's also how we live our lives. And this stuff goes on all the time. We just don't notice it. That's the availability bias, it's called, which is a fancy way of just saying we don't really notice the things that we don't notice. So we aren't aware of how much we aren't aware of. And as a result, we often, we often overestimate our powers of observation. OK? So there's another form of blindness, and it's called choice blindness. And I'd like to do a demonstration of this. But in order to do that, I need a volunteer, anyone except Rohan. <laughs> All 
All right, you my, you, my good friend. Come on up here. Yeah. Sa sa what was your name again? Safe. Safe. This is safe, everyone. Safe, take a bow. All right, safe. All right, safe. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do um, a, a, a trick, if you will, that involves choices, OK? So I've written a prediction down here on this piece of paper, and I'm going to put it in this folder, my prediction folder. It's going to be right here. Now, say I cut a newspaper clip out of the newspaper, today's Wall Street Journal. It says, verdict in weed killer case hits Bayer. I don't know. doesn't sound good. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I, you're, you're going to have to make a choice. And I'm going to, I'm going to run the, the, the scissors up and down this newspaper. And you just say stop anywhere you want, OK? Stop right there, for sure? For sure? OK. Now, I want you to take this. I don't want to touch it. And I just want you to read. Yeah. Read where you cut to. I think it's the other side. And I just want you to read the, now you could, have, you could have stopped anywhere you liked, right? Read the first three words where you stopped. Wait, wait, no, hold on. No, this is upside down. Th this is where you cut to, oh, okay. the non-upside down part, where you, where you actually stopped. Say that out loud. All right, now, we, I didn't pay you earlier or anything. OK, I'll pay you later. OK. okay. Sure. Yeah, OK, I will. A magician always keeps his word. Uh, German, what is it? What was it again? German chemical. German chemical Company. I'm pulling from my prediction folder, everyone. Let's see what we got here. German, good start. Chemical Company, how about that? Right. Thank you very much. How'd I do that? I'll tell you later. All right, I'll pay you when I give you the check. Thank you, everyone. Give a sign a round of applause. Thank you. So that's an example of uh, a kind of, well, magicians have a really great way of, of manipulating choices. In fact, there's a whole literature on it. Okay, I, I'm going to show you another version just because I can't resist because it's so fun to do this. Uh, but there's this similar kind of blindness or illusion that has to do with how we make decisions and how we interpret our decisions. And this is something that I, I find especially fascinating because life is really the sum of the choices we make, right? Uh, I recently got married two months ago. So thank you. It's funny, the, the, how much applause you get kind of determines, it depends on the age of the crowd. You know, younger, oh, yeah. People who have been around the block a little bit more, OK, OK. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very confident I made the right decision uh, because I don't think anyone else would put up with me. But, um, but you do think about that when you get married, when you change careers, when you move. You think about the choices you make and how much they mean. And we like to think we make the best decisions given what options we have. Um, but how much of that is, is us justifying it after the fact, right? And how many of those decisions are, are really free? Like, could you? have stopped anywhere? Would it have mattered where you stopped? How could I have possibly known? Unless maybe your choice wasn't as independent as you thought it was, right? Magicians have a literature on this. There are, you could fill a bookshelf with ways in which to manipulate a spectator's choice, a spectator's decision. It's really important. You have to be able to do it because a lot of tricks depend on it. And it's really fun and it's a really cool way of fooling people. Well. Psychologists have also investigated this phenomenon and how we look at our choices and how we can be blind, how the brain can blind us, not only to the impact of our choices, but to the reasons we make uh, for making them. So, For instance, in this one quite famous study, they had uh, subjects come into a lab and they showed them pictures of faces, a couple of photographs, and they asked him to choose the most attractive, the more attractive face. You know, who do you find more attractive, right? So they say, okay, this one. Then they would give them the photograph purportedly that they had picked. In fact, they would switch them first. And curiously enough, the method that they used to switch them was a sleight of hand method invented by this Austrian magician Hofzinser about a century, more than a century ago. It was quite literally a magic trick. Right? These are scientists doing magic in the lab. Uh, but no, they are real scientists. But if you look at the literature on cognitive science, so much of it is just doing magic tricks, like stealing people's watches in a lab which I love. I think that's brilliant. Um, I, I wish that, that could just be my job. Uh, so, 
so what happened? Uh, they found that, well, you probably at this point know what to expect. Most people didn't notice, right? Most people didn't notice that they had given them a completely different photograph. But here's what makes that even more interesting. Not only did people not doubt the choice that they made, that it had been their choice, right? But when asked to justify their choices, oh, why did you pick this person over this person? They constructed these very elaborate and specific post hoc justifications. Oh, I like their eyes. I like their chin. They had nice skin, right? So not only does the brain elide the fact that you were duped and your cho you weren't given what you chose, and this is something that we see, they've done experiments in supermarkets where they've had people taste different types of food and say, oh, which one's your favorite, and then given them a different one and, and told them, oh, you know, why do you like it? Oh, because blah, 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 and they don't notice the difference in taste. It happens in many, 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 many contexts. Turns out that not only do you not realize that you haven't made a free choice, right? You also justify it afterwards and to yourself to why you made that choice, right? So not only was it not your choice, but then you make it your own by telling yourself, by having your brain tell you that here's why it was the best choice, you know? Which is good in a lot of ways if you think about it, right? Because we got to get on with our day, we got to be optimistic, and we got to do our best at what we do, but it's also something that you can exploit, and it's something that magicians exploit. Mostly for entertainment, but it's also something you exploit for ill, and that's the basis of a lot of cons, right? A lot of cons is about getting you to make a choice, inspiring false confidence in someone, and then taking advantage of them. It's no coincidence that many of the techniques of magic and many of the techniques in the con world and in crime, and also in cheating at cards, overlap. Some of the best magicians were criminals, and some of the best criminals were magicians. Um, how many people here have heard of the famous three-card Monty routine? Great. So in the famous three-card Monty routine, you're given a choice between three cards that are mixed up, and you're supposed to pick one of them. Well, it's usually done with small cards, but I'm going to show it to you with bigger ones so that they're easier to see. Everyone see? This way I can't also hide them in my hands. All right? Everyone see that? Okay. So in the typical three-card Monty trick, you're, seeing, you're shown three cards, ace, two, and a three. And you have to pick the ace. That's the money card. You pick the ace, you win big money. If you don't, you lose. So usually, you take the cards, you mix them up a bit, okay? And just so you can see, you've got the ace, the two, and the three. I take one of the cards, and I'll just place it here for now. Anybody see where I put the ace? Here? No, I'm sorry. That's the two. The ace is here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You're st Thank you. Redo it, he said. Okay, you're right. I should definitely redo it. He's any just one? Okay, fine. I'm going to redo it just for him. No, I, it's it's hard to it's hard to see because I do it very fast, right? So you have three cards: the ace, the two, and the three. And you know what? To make it a little easier this time, I will. Uh, I will raise, I'll, I'll do what, what gamblers sometimes do, what hustlers sometimes do, is they'll put, they'll put a mark in a card, but in this case, what I'll do is I'll just raise it up a bit. So you can see, I'll do it a little bit more so you can see. So you can see one of the cards is now slightly higher than the other ones. So when I take the ace out of the, you can see very clearly which one it is, right? Yeah, yeah. What? No, no. I, I really did. I really did. <laughs> Okay, I'm not being completely fair. The thing is, it's very hard for you to win your money or win your money back after you've lost it, and I've seen people lose a lot of money at this. In fact, I've seen people lose thousands of dollars on the streets of New York, on the streets of Barcelona. This scam still works, and I'll explain to you a little bit more about why it works in a minute. Um, but it's very hard for you because sometimes I pretend like I'm taking one card off, but I'm actually taking two, right? Yeah, yeah, so it makes it very difficult for you to actually see what's going on. Uh, with three cards, it's almost impossible to win. But if I take out one of the cards, then it's just the two card Monty. It should be a lot easier. So let's just see if we can follow that. Hmm, what do you guys think? In fact, the ace was here the whole time. <laughs> and that's the three card Monty.
So when I was researching my book, uh, I did a lot of time investigating. I, I did a lot of time, sounds wrong. <laughs> It's a careful word choice there. Um, investigating scams and cons, the sort of darker side of magic. Right? Magicians like to fool us uh, for fun, and we enjoy it. We like being fooled. It's fun to fool people. Con artists use many of the same techniques, the willingness, our willingness to be fooled, the ways that our brain deceives us, and they turn it against us, often for ill. Three-card Monty is a very basic but beautiful example. It's one of the oldest cons in the book, and it really was, believe it or not, the origin of the modern mafia, the modern criminal enterprises, the first true organized criminal enterprises in the United States were built on scams like the Three Card Monte on the river boats back in the sort of frontier days. People made the equivalent of millions and millions of dollars just doing Monte in the shell game on boats and gambling houses out west, you know, in the, in the wild frontier uh, era. And one of my favorite stories is this guy who, uh, this guy who, it was a three-card money guy. He went to, I think, Wyoming looking for suckers and it found it very glutted. So he decided what he was going to do is he was going to open a store. And he opened a window front or a storefront where he had all these sort of luxury items priced at preposterous discounts. And he lured people in with these sale prices. And then when they got into the store, he kind of shuttled them to the back of the room where they were playing three-card Monty over a barrel. And because everyone lost all their money, no one ever bought anything. And it worked. Now, and he called it the dollar store. <laughs> True story. I guess eventually people figured out that you could make as much money and get in less trouble by just selling pretty low quality items at a, a very cheap price. And that's the ancestry behind the modern dollar story, this great revolution in price point retail, where I don't know, you could say maybe you get what you pay for, uh, sometimes even less. So I'm very interested in scams and con and magic. And I think it's because it all exploits the same architecture in the brain. And it's not just the three card Monty, but it's you know the food industry convincing us that sugary cereal is somehow part of this complete breakfast or, or how politicians use to sell us on things that are impossible promises. Why do we want to believe them? Why do we believe them? Well, I think there's a part of us that really wants to believe, that wants to trust. But there's a reason why the con artist is the only criminal we call an artist. Because it does take a certain deft touch to do that, right? To steal from someone, to have them choose to give you their money, their purse, their vote, and then just walk away clean. Right? So while we're talking about that, I'd like to get into sort of the another type of magic, another type of deception that isn't often considered or associated with magic. And that's, uh, that's called mentalism. How many people have heard of mentalism? Okay, what, just, what, what do you, uh, to, you, was that you that raised your hand, miss? What do you associate with mentalism? What, what are, where the magician can read your mind, right, or predict the future, or things like that, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. How many people have seen those kinds of performers? Yeah. And um, another, have people seen the ones where people like bend metal? That's another one where telekinesis, uh, right? Okay. Um, so I, I'd like to do a little demonstration of that, that because I think, I think that's a very interesting kind of magic as well. Because mentalism uses many of the same kind of techniques that we see in choice blindness and change blindness and inattentional blindness. And um, I'll, give you, I'll give you just a very quick example. Um, let me just, uh, let's see here. I have a piece of paper here, and I don't want to take too much time, so I'm just going to, let's see, a pen here. Hi. Um, what's, uh, you know, you've already done it. You've done it once already. You, you, you want to do it again? No, you cannot do it again. One ride per customer, sir. <laughs> here, what's your name? Dave, look, I'm just going to, you don't have to come up. I'm just going to ask you to, got a, that's your name here. And I'm just going to make a little X on here. And I just, I just want you to write the first name of someone who's, who's close to you, but, but not here right now. And, and you need something to write on, maybe? Here. Just, just in, in clear, big letters, just right there. You can, but don't let me see it. Just, just write their first name, like all caps, if you will, or first name of someone who's close to you, but not here, or friend, whatever. I'm just giving you a 
Yeah, good. And then just fold the, thank you. Just fold that where, yeah, perfect, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Tell me your name again. Dave? Okay, Dave. All right, so Dave, this is just a, not a very sophisticated example. I'm, I don't want to look at it. I just want to get a, a sensation here. Now, Dave, is this, I'm getting a sense that this is someone you've known for a while, right? It's, a, it's not a family member, is it? It is, right? A female family member, perhaps? Do you have a sister or a wife? Jan, is that it? Jan, who's Jan? Your older sister. How about that? That's what I thought. I was getting a sisterly. Thank you. Wow, how did he do that, right? So, <laughs> so I can't read minds. Uh, you, you, you don't sign, you seem skeptical. Okay, that's good. Skepticism is a good attitude, especially when dealing with this kind of stuff. A lot of people want you to believe it's real. And I don't want to make this into a PSA, but this is just tricks. This is just magic. But boy, don't you want to believe something like that? I've, had, I've done this for people. Uh, oh, you're about to have a child. Oh, I see a number two. Uh, it's a combination of psychology and, and some tricks, some sleight of hands. There's books on it if you want to you wanna read up on it. But boy, is it compelling. Because now it's not about fooling you, right? Now it's about understanding you, right? It's about telling you about yourself. You know, oh, you were always closer to Jan, weren't you, you know? But she's, she's not, she, did she get in touch with you recently? Did she have some news? Yeah, some, what was the news? Did she, about a cousin? Okay, there's some news, right? Have we met before? No, we've never met before. You seem happy about that. <laughs> so mentalism is a branch of magic that deals with this kind of stuff. And this is very powerful. And it's also something that we should be skeptical of. And you know who is skeptical of this is magicians. In fact, there's groups of magicians that are devoted to outing mentalists who try to pass off their magic as real. That's right. Houdini, in fact, spent a lot of his life as an agent of popular skepti uh, skepticism. What people don't tell you is he also started out as a mentalist. In the early days of his career, he would go to towns, he would learn about the recently deceased, and then he would pretend to talk to the dead. Um, later on in life, after he failed to be able to contact his mother, this was at the height of the spiritualism movement, seances and spirit mediums, um, he was so disillusioned that he spent many, many, many years actively um, debunking spiritualists and people who claim they could talk to the dead and tell the future. And, uh, but he always did hold out a little hope in the afterlife. And he told his wife, he gave his wife a secret word, and he said, uh, every year on the anniversary of my death, I want you to have a seance, and if I, I'm going to try and communicate that word to you. And uh, I don't know that she ever succeeded, but the Houdini seance has since become kind of a ritual. And magicians still have it every year on Halloween. It's kind of fun. You go to the Magic Castle, they have a big, in LA, they have a big Houdini seance every year. Um, but this kind of magic is very interesting because it exploits other psychological principles, but also something that is kind of longing in us. Now, there was a, a psychologist by the name of Bertrand Four who did a series of experiments some years ago that kind of sheds light on the cognitive underworkings of these kinds of illusions. He did it in his class. He gave his students a personality assessment test. He, he called it the um, diagnostic interest blank, I think. And it was essentially a series of questions that were designed to figure out what kind of person you are, what kind of temperament you had, what you were like. Then after everyone submitted it, he gave each individual student a personality sketch, a personality assessment, essentially, like a, you know, a character assessment, and had the students gauge how accurate they thought they were. From zero, meaning no, that doesn't describe me even at all, to five, you know, that's exactly who I am. That really nailed it. Right? And he found that the average was about 4.2, 4.3. In other words, yeah, pretty good, pretty good. Well, it turns out that he hadn't actually looked at the tests, he'd thrown them in the trash, and given every student an identical personality assessment that he'd gotten from like a newsstand astrology book. This experiment has been repeated many, many times, and the average, remarkably, always hovers around that, right? Some 85% of people believe it, right? Our brain wants us to believe that we can be understood, that we can be, you know, that we can be verified, right? That we can talk to people, that we can, that people can understand our dreams. And there's a deep psychology to this that is exploited time and again in various situations. 
there's a good side to this again. Like this is sort of the basis of trust, right? We want to be able to trust people. We want to feel like we're not alone. All of these things I'm telling you about are the flip side of things that make us human, right? But everything kind of comes with a cost. I like to think about, as a metaphor, the, the um, soft spot in the baby's brain, the fontanelle, as it's called. Right? Why do we have a fontanelle? Why are we born with a soft spot? Does anyone know? Because our, our brains are so big, right? Our brains are so big, you need a little bit of a, a soft spot to, to get your head out. And, um, and so it's a vulnerability, right, for the first, uh, gosh, I don't even know how long, six months-ish that it lasts, however long, 12 months, the baby's vulnerable. But it's the flip side of this incredible virtue, which is our intelligence, our big brain. That's what sets us apart as humans. All these things I like to understand as sort of the, the, the other side of the coin, as it were. So anyway, back to these experiments. Uh, they've done these many times, these, these four experiments. It's called the Barnum effect, uh, colloquially. And um, one version of it that I think is very interesting that they did was they had people come in and they did a similar thing where they, but they divided people into groups of three and they had one group uh, tell the, the reader, the psychic or the astrologer, whatever, uh, their no information. And the second group gave them, I think, the, the month and year of their birth. And then the third person gave them like the exact day of their birth. Right? So each person gave them a little bit more information. And then they gave them identical readings, and they had them rate the, rank the readings again on how accurate they saw, thought they were. And it turns out the people who gave no information ranked them in the like mid to high threes, 3.6, 3.7. People who gave uh, a little bit of information ranked them in the fours. And the people who gave a lot of information ranked it higher, closer to 4.2, 4.3, which is incredible, right? Because it's, it means that the perceived accuracy of the reading was not a function of what the astrologer told them, but what they told the astrologer. Right? And you see this actually done a lot in like business, right? Where we have this illusion of customization, right? You fill out a survey. Oh, how are we doing? You fill out uh, you know, some sort of questionnaire, and then they deliver us something, and we're, our brain tricks us into believing that it's somehow more suited to our needs or that it's more customized towards us. That's actually a bias that we all have. And it's something that, well, we can all be aware of. OK, so this is just fun. Uh, this is another kind of mentalism. I have two spoons here. Uh, I'm going to use one of them as an experimental spoon and one as a control. So someone point, which one should I use? You, sir. This one? OK, so this one, th you want me to use this one as a control or as a, <laughs> sorry, start over. That's the control or that's the, no, okay, it doesn't really matter. You can inspect the spoons afterwards. But what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to bend one of them, right? So watch closely. Okay, can everyone see? You see that? Oh, okay, I got a little bit there. I got a little bit going. Can you see? You see, I got it going a little bit. Right? Right? It's weird. Is it, what'd you say? You're still skeptical. That's good. Well, let me do it again. Let me do a little bit more. Let me see if I can't summon a little bit more energy. Because, I mean, the eyes don't lie here, right? This is, you're seeing it. You're seeing what I'm seeing. Check it out. It's a bit more even, right? Wow, okay. It's going to take all my energy, guys. Good thing I had that Jamba Juice earlier. I'm going to try and do it a little bit more, okay? And, and here, if you want to hold on to the control spoon so you can compare. Okay, good. Yeah, okay. Now watch carefully. I want you to watch the bell of the spoon right here, okay? Can everyone see? Yeah, maybe here. All right, let's see here. Let's see that control spoon here. Thank you. Wow, check that out, guys. Right a lot. How about that? Wow. The thing is, really, guys, it's just an illusion because the spoons were never actually bent. <laughs> yeah. 
Anyway, so, so what is all this all about? What is the point of all of this? Why are you telling us this, Alex? Uh, well, we're talking about being fooled, and I'm talking about how the brain fools us. And we're also talking about why it's fun to fool people, right? Uh, magic is fun because it's a controlled way of experiencing a loss of control, right? It's like riding a roller coaster, in a way, you know? Um, it's a way of, it operates on these kind of metaphors, too. You know, disappearance can be thought of as a metaphor for death, for instance. That's why when you make something vanish, you always have to bring it back, because it causes tension. It exploits these loopholes in our brains, these cognitive lapses that are fundamental to, make us, to what make us human, but are also ingrained in us and occur all the time, every day. We walk through our lives using these mechanisms and also falling prey to them in various ways. So I like magic in a way because I think it makes us smarter and it makes us less naive, less gullible. Being fooled awakens you to how easily we can be fooled, even if you have a Nobel Prize, right? It's, uh, it makes you smart enough to realize that you can be dumb, right? As it were. Uh, so, it, and it's, to me, really beautiful that in an age of high-tech CGI, something as simple as an, something an, an analog tool like a deck of cards can also just be mystifying, right? You don't need these big set pieces. Uh, certainly big illusions and magic are fun, but I pref I'm more of a, a fan of sleight of hand, right? Which is, is as simple as it gets. Um, it's also fun to fool people, right? Who doesn't enjoy that a little bit, right? The psychologist Paul Ekman coined a term, he calls it duping delight. Duping delight is the pleasure we get from putting one over on someone. And magicians have perfected this. And they throw tournaments and contests where they get together and they try to fool each other. There's even a Magic Olympics that takes place every three years. And at the Magic Olympics, the best magicians from all over the world come together and they try to fool each other. And they have these contests in different categories. And the judges are all experts. And they give them you know, ratings like figure skating. And the same kind of thing. And you would ask, well, how can magicians fool each other? And the answer is magicians fool each other all the time because they're always coming up with new and ingenious tricks. I think a lot of people assume that magic is like the same 12 tricks over and over again. And part of that may be because magic doesn't reveal its secrets. And as a result, there's this kind of wall behind the, you know, that the magician hides behind. And I think that's good in a way because it preserves the mystery, but I also think it sells magic a little bit short because you don't realize the kind of beauty and skill and elegance behind a lot of it, right? I didn't even get to talk about mathematics, but the mathematics of shuffling, for instance, is a very beautiful field, and there's a lot of magic tricks based on it, and it ties into all kinds of interesting mathematical phenomena and chaos theory and the way chemicals mix. Um, so it's fun to fool people, and it's fun to be fooled, and I'd like to sort of conclude on that note by telling you a story. And it's the story of one of the greatest magicians who ever lived. But in order to tell the story, I do need another volunteer. And nope. <laughs> it's just, it's a, come on. All right, you, you sir, <laughs> you ma'am, come on up. On up, on up here. What, yep, what's your name? Lucy. Lucy, everyone. All right, take a bow, Lucy. All right, Lucy. Very nice to meet you. How old are you, Lucy? Uh, Eleven. All right, it's a good age. It's a good age. Uh, and what, are you, what do you do? What's your, are you a lawyer, a doctor? What do you do? <laughs> okay, well, we, we all got to, you know, everyone at their own pace. Do you know, what, what do you study? What's your favorite class? Okay, that's cool, yeah. All right, Lucy, do you, do you like magic? Okay, great. So we're gonna, sh we're gonna do a trick that's, it's, um, well, it's, it's kind of a classic, but let's, let's just see what happens, all right? We're gonna try it. Uh, first of all, I'd like you to just reach out your, your finger and just touch a card. Just touch one. That one there? Okay, take it, take it, look at it, all right? Okay, cool. Yeah, good. All right, now let's just uh, put it in the deck anywhere you like. And, and here, shuffle the, oh, I guess no one else got to see that. All right, let's, let's try that again. We'll do it again, because I, I, it's true. We should, we should all get to enjoy the map, <laughs> not just. Uh, so let's, let's, try, let's try it better. Here, okay. Yeah, just touch another card. That one, okay. 
And let's show everyone and show the camera. And it's going to be a little bit hard for me not to see it, but I'll just hide. I guess I saw that one. Here, Lucy, take a different one. Take a completely different card. All right, now show everyone. All right. Now, I said a different one, Lucy. Okay, no, it, clearly you were meant to pick that one. All right. So here's what we're going to do. I want you to just take, your, uh, take this marker. I want you to sign your name in big letters across the face of that card. Big letters. I think you're going to be a doctor. Yep. Okay, so I'm having you, I had you sign this card. Actually, if you want to sit, if you'd be more comfortable, just sit. Yeah. All right, cool. So I had Lucy sign the card. That's your card because I may have more than one uh, two of hearts in the deck. But clearly, this is the only one with Lucy's signature on it, right? Now, the story I'm going to tell you is about this magician by the name of Di Vernon. Okay, Di Vernon was a Canadian sleight of hand magician. Has anyone here heard of him? I, probably not that many. A couple people have. Really only known to magicians, but he really probably was the greatest sleight of hand magician of the, of the 20th century, of the modern era. Um, and he's known as the man who fooled Houdini, which is what inspired the title of my book. Houdini had this famous boast used to say, nobody can fool me with the same trick if I see it done more than once, if I see it done three times. Now, how many people here have heard that you're never supposed to repeat a trick for the same audience, right? You've heard that, you know? It's kind of one of the cardinal rules. It's like, don't tell the secret, but also don't repeat a trick. Well, why? Partly because magic relies on, you know, not paying attention to certain things. It relies on surprise. And the idea is that once might be a trick, but twice is a lesson. Right? You do it enough times, you're going to figure it out. Well, the, bo the boast, the challenge was unmet for years. And then one day, at a dinner in Houdini's honor, Di Vernon did a version of this trick I'm about to show you, in which he took Lucy's card, or whoever, Houdini's card, you're Houdini in this case, all right, in this scenario, the two of hearts, and he placed it in the middle of the deck. Pick up about half the cards, about half. It doesn't have to be exact. Good. And then put them on top of the two. Great. Perfect. You want to see? Then he did a magical gesture. Do you know any magical gestures? Do you know any magic words? <laughs> <laughs> Abracadabra, as good as ever anyone. Hocus Pocus is also a popular choice, but that's fine. And the card magically just jumped to the top. Oh, that's pretty good. Hey, guys, give Lucy a hand. <laughs> nope. Go, go. Uh, it's not over yet. It's not over yet because, like I said, Houdini did it multiple times. Or, I, Vernon, showed Houdini multiple times, right? But one time, yeah, one time, big deal, right? But he did it again. He took the two of hearts. He took it. He put it in the middle. Maybe he put it even a little bit lower this time so the card has farther to travel. He did a magical gesture, snapped his fingers, and there it was again. Okay? Two of hearts again. I'll show you one more time. Here, um, Lucy, that's your card, right? Okay? Now watch. You can see me put it in right, like this. You see that? Okay. Now look, it's not on the top. That's not it. It's not on the bottom, right? Okay. But the thing is, what's actually happening here is the card that's on the top, the moment I do the move, changes into the two of hearts. Okay. Right there. Yeah. You know, you, you just, he's he's the skeptic right there. The skeptic. <laughs> Oh, okay. We'll talk afterwards. Um, so, so how do I do that? Here, I'll show you. I'll show you another another version of it. Um, I'll let you push the card in. That's good. She. That's good, Lucy. Most people would days go go days go by and they would notice you. You picked up quick. Very good. Diverna continued to do this trick. It, legend has, supposedly he did it like eight times or something before Houdini finally walked out in defeat. And since then, he was the man who fooled Houdini, this great legend. Um, I think the, the, the climax, he, he, he did what a lot of hustlers will sometimes do. He, will, he uh, put what's known as a, 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 grip, um, a, um, a breather in the card. So, um, so what, what that means is you put a bend in a card. Uh, so you take the... Take the, the card and you bend it. 
So that way you can see. Di Vernon, he grew to be, I think, 93 or something. And at the end of his life, they asked him, you know, what, what more could you want? You've been a success. You're the envy of your peers. You've had a wonderful life. Uh, the card goes in there. And now you actually see the moment when it rises to the top. On the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. See that? Thank you. Lucy, thank you very much. Lucy, everyone. And Di Vernon asked, was asked, what more could you possibly want in life? You've had this incredible life. Um, you're beloved. Uh, you've lived to a, a ripe old age. And you've obviously fooled every magician out there. And he responded in one of my favorite uh, quotes of all time, not just in magic, but in life. He said, you know, they asked him, what, what's one more thing you could possibly want before you die? He said, I just wish someone could fool me one more time. That's it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.